Welcome everyone to another episode of JutsCast. This is the second episode of our third season where we'll be discussing user empowerment. Before we start, please make sure to subscribe or follow on whichever platform you're listening on. Also remember, we love to hear your thoughts, so follow us on Twitter at JuxPro. So welcome everyone. I'm John Pither, the CEO of Juxt. I'm Malcolm Sparks, CTO of Juxt. I am Jeremy, I'm the product manager for XTDB. And I'm Stephen Diabold. I work in XTDB markets. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. So Malcolm, do you want to start and just tell us what you mean by user empowerment? Why might users be disempowered and how can we empower them? I feel that users aren't getting the control that they used to have of software. Software is delivered to them and they get to use it, but they don't get to control it. A good example of something that gives user power is Excel, where somebody can kind of create their own program inside of Excel. Microsoft create Excel, the development team produce new releases, but really they don't have to because users have so much control over the spreadsheet. You know, hey, they might want to have an extra formula or two, but really users can survive without continual releases of the software. Another example we kind of point to, uh, Jeremy and I, we've had conversations, haven't we, about Lotus Notes. Yeah, so I first came across it when I joined the IBM summer internship program in 2010. I think at that point, Lotus Notes was somewhere around 27 years old. It was born in the day of dial-up. And by the time IBM acquired it, it had sort of taken the world by storm for being a great email client. And so my experience with Lotus Notes was as Gmail or Outlook. You know, It's a, an interface for looking at my inbox, and I didn't really think much of it. It wasn't until I sat down and read about distributed databases and the history of CouchDB that I realized what this thing was. It turns out it's more than just an email browser. It's like a visual basic or something. It's a toolkit for users to build their own applications on this distributed, encrypted document database. Pretty, Pretty marvelous piece of tech. You mentioned visual basic. I think that's another one where users could create their own applications. Things like Fox Pro, FileMaker, HyperCard. These applications where users could get by. So we're talking about this full separation of developers and users where developers kind of control everything. They get to control all the releases and all the feature sets. And that's what we mean by users being disempowered. It does depend on the class of applications you're talking about. Yeah, I was thinking that Microsoft Access is one of those tools that gave users so much power. that They can create forms and views. It's incredibly powerful. So your contention is developers themselves take on more responsibilities. In the end, the user just has maybe a couple of buttons where they just have to click a few things and make it work. But what they lose in that process is all of the actual power to be able to customize and build their own solutions. Yeah, I think it is a little bit like if a user, to use your example, John, was to say, oh, I'd quite like that font to be green. And then a whole kind of process is followed. Ah, okay, we need the green font. That becomes a card. It goes into a backlog. It gets scheduled into a release. And then a developer goes and kind of picks up that card. The font becomes green. And then that's delivered to the users. And they said, oh, I didn't really want it that shade of green. The developers are continuously part of that feedback loop until they're not. And when developers go off and do another project, then the users are disempowered. They don't even get to change the color of their fonts. They can't. So by bringing in developers and making them such an important part of that feedback loop, we've become dependent. We've created a dependency culture on developers so that we can't live without them as users. It reminds me of the time I worked on a software. There were all these rules that we would configure to feed this downstream system. The rules were hand-coded by us. So every time someone said, I want to add a new field or change the value of this field using this formula, be a developer, would take that story from Jira, agree it with a BA, it would get put into a sprint, and they'd do this change, and then a week later it would go into production. But we were caught in this trap where the users weren't sure what they wanted. So every week, the same requirement would almost come back again. And we had a couple of developers that were extremely efficient and very good at making these changes. But they got so good, they just became part of that machinery, part of that process. And it was so inefficient. But one of the reasons that they did that was because if they made a rule engine or something that was more powerful for the users, then that would be considered a power tool. And the bank didn't necessarily want that because they couldn't be version controlled and released in the same way. So there's this weird sort of anti-pattern where the tools had to be not so powerful and the devs actually had to do those fine grain changes all the time, a weird sort of incentive. What they did is saying, well, hey, the devs have got great auditing, versioning and an approval mechanism, pull requests or what have you. 
developers have all these wonderful tools, so let's put all of the compliance into the development process. That's interesting, and certainly I think that developers have incredibly powerful tools. I think there is a growing problem where we've identified some examples of very agile software like Excel, Visual Basic, and Lotus Notes. But there is all too often custom software that's developed that is not agile. It doesn't need to be because the agility is a measurement of the human developers in the process. In fact, it doesn't need to be software that's designed to last because it only has to last a few minutes. And this is another side effect of continuous integration is that we've built these machines that can pump out the best version of the software that's ever been created and it releases that software. And then five minutes later, something else needs to change. Some other feature or requirement comes along. And so it's released again. In the creation of this continuous integration pipeline machine, we've actually allowed the artifacts themselves, the software that we develop, to become very static, brittle, and inflexible, simply because it doesn't need to flex. Now, when you build a skyscraper or a building, the builders build the skyscraper, and then they finish the skyscraper. The skyscraper has to survive on its own without the builders. And so the skyscraper gets to flex and be tolerant for all sorts of different weather conditions. You don't ring up the builders and get them to come back after every storm or do continuous maintenance on the building. And in software, we don't really have that finish line, or at least as developers, we haven't really focused on the end result. Because for us, we're always in this process of improving. As developers, we never experience what it's like to use software that we can't continuously improve. We can't envisage a world where developers are so plentiful. So at some point, we've got to decide which software are we going to abandon and which software are we going to maintain. Yeah, but aren't we afraid that if we don't continue to change software, that we lose the ability to change it? We forget what's in there. We forget about the code. The team might rotate. There might be some attrition and people that have that knowledge about the code and the way the system works and how it evolved have moved on. So if you don't keep making changes and keeping it up to date, then you lose the ability to make changes. That's right. The ability to make changes is in the developer's world. So the knowledge of how the system works, the tests, the code base itself is structured such that developers can take it on and make changes to it. But what we're sort of asking is, how do we get the users more involved so that the users can take software from us, from developers, and the users can make those tweaks and kind of evolve the system? And that's a much more challenging thing to contemplate. Yeah. It's like code is the problem, right? Like as soon as you've got a big code base, then you need lots of developers to maintain it. They need to have it booted up. They need to understand the context. And the only way to do that is for them to continuously make changes, continuous deployment. But what you're saying is that actually we need to get away from that mindset and somehow we need to invert it. Yeah, and I feel that finding the right interface between developers and users is the key. Spreadsheets, for example, found a very nice interface, which was the interface of the grid. Users maintain the formulas and the numbers in the spreadsheet. Developers should be free to specialize on things that only developers should be allowed to do. And I would include things like data storage, serialization, data formats, security. You know, it's very important that expert developers attend to security requirements of the system. But I don't think developers should take on the role of being the subject matter experts as well. That's a lot to ask of developers. But if you look at most code bases, you see a fusion of some networking, storage, database stuff. But there's also a heap of code that you can tell just by reading it, which is around the domain, the nouns and the verbs of the subject matter, which really should be the preserve of the subject matter experts. But why is it sitting there in the same code base? The banks kind of have this to some degree, right? Because you've got the trading floor. And typically in large sort of fintech places, the areas around the trading is a bit more ad hoc. And there they do use more the powerful tools like spreadsheets and things, you know, let's grab some data from this system using some scripts and we'll whack it onto a spreadsheet and we'll configure it this way. And there's far more about the at hand domain that the users need to have right there embedded in the spreadsheets. But then once it flows down to more strategic middle office, that's when things get more codified. There's more developers that are working on it to take that data and do all the things that you suggest, like to apply security, to create different views, to funnel it onwards. 
interesting there is that split there the different set of approaches so just thinking through your argument there it's like the middle office where the code really needs to be more strategic less knowing about the actual data that's going in there so the sort of changes are more about the operational characteristics what do you think Stephen? So first of all, it's fun and amusing to me that all of our positive examples of user empowerment from the 90s and early 2000s are either Microsoft products or Lotus Notes, which I'm not sure if you were still using Lotus Notes at ThoughtWorks, John, but it wasn't universally loved, (laughs) partly because it was a 30-year-old product. But I do think that there is an interesting divide here between the developers who are coming up with domains as part of the systems that they're building and the users who are actually defining those domains or that own those domains and the history that we're coming out of, where in the early 90s, certainly, there existed systems which you could still turn on today and still behave in the same way. They are that sort of skyscraper. So for me, that was an Amiga in North America. For you folks, it might have been a BBC Micro. But you might have one of these machines in your garage, you might be able to plug it in today, boot it up, stick in a disk, and you can still play one of the old games or use your old accounting software. And it would work as it did in the 90s. And so there's a bit of a question of software delivery to some degree that seems to affect how stable the systems can be and how much they perhaps necessarily need to grow with society and the fact that they're inherently networked now. So you wouldn't have software for a BBC Micro that deals with GDPR, obviously. It's kind of inherent to that software that it wouldn't need to. You don't end up with legislation covering the sort of software we had back then. And to some degree, it feels like we're in our infancy with building the kind of software that we need to build these days that travels over networks and deals with a business that is in a changing legislative space. And we maybe just haven't reached the point where we can actually evolve these systems such that we can give the users a powerful user interface. And we can say, here, you can customize this, you can write some scripts, or you can add some powerful programming techniques as the user to the endpoint that you have accessible to you, because it definitely existed in the 90s. And I will admit to missing Visual Basic and Microsoft Access for all their problems. They were fun tools to use. And it feels like in our current world of Google Docs and Slack, we don't have those tools anymore, or at least I'm maybe not familiar with them. Yeah, it's maybe it is a selective memory because there certainly wasn't a software nirvana in the 90s. It was very unstable. Things didn't work. Lots of weird issues. But I still think that when we, as a development community, embraced incrementalism and doing things in short iterations and small increments, we wanted to make the development process itself more predictable, then there was something that we sacrificed in doing that. The user experience today is one of constant change. Certainly as a user myself, I quite like the fact that I go to my mail client Excel or Emacs, that it is the same as it was the day before. And it does perturb me sometimes when I do an update and things are not quite the same. And you can hear users on all sorts of forums complain, even if a piece of software is really poor and doesn't do a good job. If it stays the same, you kind of get used to its snags and wrinkles. You can see this every day inside companies where the software is terrible, but people get used to it. But the users, are they really asking for constant change? I mean, I'm sure if the changes are justified on the basis that they're all improvements, then you should rapidly get to something that is a better piece of software. But I think that most users' point of view, they're not improvements. You know, if we think Microsoft are a good example, we'll pick a Microsoft product like Skype and say that actually in the heyday of Skype, everybody agrees that Skype was a wonderful product. And now most people agree that Skype is a terrible product. Is it because it's the same or did they change it? I think that they did change it. So I'm not saying that this is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying that this is a developer-centric thing. We created an incremental process because it suited us as developers, right? We didn't ask the users if they wanted it. And if you look at the Agile Manifesto, It really is that the priority is in creating software early and giving releases early to users. 
And I'm sure there are some users that at the beginning of a development process, it is a nice thing to get your software ahead of time. But I just think that's not the only thing that users want. It's interesting to talk about these two directions that change can go in. Either your graph can tilt up and maybe change is always giving you something a little bit nicer, or maybe your graph is tilting down. And in the case of Skype, your software is decaying. I was talking to Jeremy earlier about one of his software lifecycle lamentations, and it was actually about an end of life of Google+, Plus, which I never used heavily, but Jeremy was saying he used it quite heavily. And in the case of Google+, Plus, for him, he actually ended up with nothing at the end of it, where the software was gone and his data was gone. And that story is indicative of where every piece of software eventually goes. Eventually, every piece of software will die unless you know it's brick breaker on an Amiga or something like that, where you can still turn it on in 50 years. But I think that's important for us to keep in mind that not all software lasts forever. And in particular, the kind of software that we're building today will eventually have an end of life. And that part of what we should think about as that software is being born is maybe how it will die. I think there's a lot of parallels with how we conceive of these notions of life cycles with development itself. So as a developer, I could create an API for another developer to use. And there's a certain level of respect I'm going to give that developer because it might be myself wearing a different hat, or at least it's someone that I can deeply sympathize with. But with a user, we're presenting them these user interfaces, which are essentially a type of API. You know, They are a way for that person to access the capability. Maybe they have to do some clicking or talking or something else. But whenever we break that, we should give those users the same respect as developers give to other developers in terms of trying to avoid breaking at all costs, because I think that's what the damage is, really. It's that users invest energy in learning and adapting to fit an API, as in the user interface, and then when that's broken, that energy is destroyed and everyone loses in the process. Although, you know, to the developer who's uh, responsible for it, it's just, uh, oh, we lost some users that month, but they've been replaced by other users, and maybe it's okay, but it's a big black hole of energy. I think that's a great point about the API. The user interface is an API then you can just imagine there's loads of endpoints on this API. And which would you prefer to maintain from a developer perspective? A huge API with lots of endpoints or a smaller one with fewer but more powerful endpoints? How do we move forward then? What is the solution? I mean, I've presented a lot of you know, what I see as a, a problem. One of the things I wanted to mention is that there's a word about developers working in perpetuity a system can only survive as long as there's a team of developers. And I would be quite afraid. I think if we just look up the manifesto, the Agile Principles, there is quite an interesting one about the sponsors, developers and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. And that should be quite scary. I'm having an extension to my house at the moment and we're asking builders, how long is the project going to last for? You know, I don't want to hear the word indefinite. So if we accept the fact that this model of having developers around all the time is broken. It's just not going to scale into the future. What should we be doing that's different? And I think part of the solution is to rethink what users actually want. And I think part of the answer is that users have got a desire to access their data, let's say, right? That users are keener on their own data. That's really what they want. The application or the code is really giving the users tools in order to access the data. And I think of it like the Unix file system. You have a few tools that don't need to change, and they're not integrated. They're just different tools, but it's the data that's integrated. It's the file system that, that is the integration point. And I think as developers, we fuss too much on the integration of code rather than the integration of data. We say integration is a really hard problem. And that's why we should do it continuously. If you read Martin Fowler's justification of continuous integration is that integration is a hard problem. But the way that we've solved that problem is by just getting better at integrating it. But I think one answer is just not to do it as much. Rather than trying to create these all singing, all dancing experiences where fantastic code integrated into these large applications, I think we should be prepared to create really small pieces of code that can die. And you kind of allow, you just allow code to die. As long as data doesn't die, it's okay for code to die because maybe that's just evolution and the survival of the fittest. Maybe we need to create a kind of an evolutionary selection mechanism in order to improve software.
So to take another sort of organic metaphor, I often think about uh, dinosaurs as being like the classic villain. And what if the software applications, these big packages or ecosystems that we've invented are a bit like the dinosaurs, they're too big, too unworldly, like they're keeping down the mammals from living the, the happy life. There's something about the fact that these large things, no one really has like a unified vision of product managers come and go. The, the original developers have long gone. Like in the same way you get zombie companies, what if these things are actually like zombie bits of software that just consume everyone's time and energy and they keep growing and they're not really serving their original purpose or any purpose? It would have been a lot better if people that wrote that code had written it knowing that it had a finite life cycle and it wasn't going to just be polluting the world by existing endlessly. So maybe we should view code as not just a technical debt from a project perspective, but a societal perspective. It's not just some code in a Git repo. It's like, oh, now it's everyone's headache because this thing has to be understood for as long as it's used. It's code as pollution. To go back to your Google Plus example, Jeremy, we were talking earlier about how it's entirely possible that Google Plus could have given you an export of your data. You could say, oh, click this button and you get a zip file of all the images and all the videos and all the posts and everything. It doesn't need to be that accessible. It doesn't need to be an open format or anything like that. It just needs to be something that you can read. And it's maybe a happy thing that Google Plus dies. And then maybe Jeremy writes an alternative in the future based on the fact that he wants to get his data out. It seems like if we lived in that world, you really would be in this position that companies are already in, where there's this adage that data is long lived. The code isn't long lived in any given company, but the data lasts forever. You put data in a database and somebody has to make sure that that database is still around because somebody will be using that data. And it feels like as regular old consumers, we could very well be living in a world like that, and that that would be perfectly okay to let software come and go and let the data persist longer and longer. And if you want to make use of it, good. And if you don't, also good. But you still have access to it if you ever want to in the future. I should point out that actually Google did offer an export facility, and I did download an archive via the Google Takeout service, which in fairness wasn't the worst experience, but I have never opened that zip file, and I may never open that zip file. Whereas if there was a web page, that looks exactly like what I remember, and I could navigate that as if it were at the time, like an you know, archive.org kind of interface. I'd be delighted. So another idea we discussed in this context earlier was the idea of an escrow service. So short of reinventing what Google Plus looked like, if they just had their source code out there, then maybe we could spin up a server or you know, something locally and import that data again and recreate the user interface, even just to remember what it looks like. I don't even know if anyone's archived it in any way, apart from some screenshots, perhaps. These things are just lost to time. But I do think the data we capture isn't always the most important data. Sometimes it is the look and feel of a page, which you know, allows you to connect with the context of that information. So just the raw data, the rows and the SQL table aren't always enough, in my opinion. I want to be able to have that real time machine experience and go back to computing as of you know, 2008. Which I suppose that speaks directly to the fact that code itself is data, right? So it actually reminds me of a fourth year computer science professor I had. He was an advisor to me in a fifth year project later on, and he was a really sweet guy. And he had this very liberal perspective on open source software and licensing and things like that. But in his classes, he refused to push his perspective on his students. The only thing that he would say is, if you become one of these rich startup founders when you leave university, please, if your startup fails, open source your software. <laughs> it's a huge waste for you to go out and build a thing and then just let it die and disappear completely. And I agree that it seems unnecessarily wasteful. You can let software die, but it could be dead on GitHub or on GitLab or in your own Git repo or wherever. It doesn't need to be dead and invisible, particularly if it is dead to you as the creator. There's no more reason to try to hide the source code. I do think that is sort of a shame that that isn't the attitude that more people have that, oh, okay, once this piece of software is effectively done, we'll just send it out, <laughs> see what happens. Probably nothing will happen, and that's also fine, but at least it's there. I don't think it's like it's a bit unfair to think that people want to keep software alive, and that's the reason why we keep building these brittler systems that always need this change to occur. I think coming back to that sort of 
we're trying to solve a social problem sometimes with our software projects. So the use of microservices and different teams. And the Agile Manifesto says that we need to respond to change over following a plan. So this idea that we really don't know what we're doing. So devs need to talk to the users and we always need to be thinking, what's next? What's next? Okay, I'll add this code for you. Let's get it out in a release and then you can see what it looks like and we can test it. We need to build more of a skyscraper and that's going to take some more planning. We need to think about the swaying and take that into account. I'm just wondering, how do we go from here? Because it's easy to kind of say that we should plan for our software to die. I think that's a great thing. I don't want software to outlive me. I mean, it'd be horrific to think about all those systems that I built that some poor teams and developers are still trying to maintain. It's like, I fear for them. And yes, is it open source versus closed source mentality? What's happening now that can help us? Because I think we are in a hole. How, how do we stop building such tight domain models into our code and making our codes look so close to reality in terms of what's happening inside the code? that as soon as reality changes or something changes in the business world, oh no, we've got to change all our code. How do we just follow a new route out of this malaise that we're in? I do think it's interesting that the domain-driven design community certainly seems to have been the group globally that has really beaten their heads against a brick wall in this respect to trying to figure out how to capture domains. And some of the work there is certainly perhaps the antithesis of what Malcolm is describing. But I think that Domain Driven Design Europe, the most recent conference that was actually run with live human beings, so that was probably 2018 or 2019, almost every talk, as far as I could tell, was on eventing systems. And it seems like we're maybe at the tipping point, and I realize that working on an immutable database team probably keeps this on the the top of my mind all the time, but a tipping point in terms of data storage and our ability to keep track of everything that's happening immutably. And that if you can speak this language to the users about what is happening in your business, what is happening in your game, what is happening in your desktop software, and whatever it is that is happening is some sort of event that's occurring at any given point in time. And that the user could start customizing and building these sorts of nouns and verbs into their own software around the events that they're actually participating in, and that that might lead to a sort of framework that allows them to expand the software themselves. And it might be a a sort of extension to the kinds of customizable software we had in the past. So in the past, it was Visual Basic for applications or something like that. And then in the more recent past, it was maybe Lua for video games, and that perhaps we're, we're on the cusp of coming up with programmable customization that's safe for users to work in that speaks this language of events that people seem so keen on trying to to capture as a programming language somehow. I think where that's beneficial is that events at least are a data format. An event is a piece of data, and that is then becoming emphasized as important. I think if you want to exploit your users, what you do is you create wonderful experiences for them in code And then you keep the data locked up and perhaps you can't even export it. And if you can export it, it's all kind of some big binary blob. That's how you exploit users because you lock them into your ecosystem. How you empower users is you give them access to their data because users care about their data more than they care about the experience, although you can fool them for, you know, a bit. The data is really more important. And I think to the point that standard data formats are more important actually to society than free software. It's a big statement. It's incredibly important that you could imagine a piece of free software being so complex that nobody understood it anymore. They could run it. They couldn't understand or change it. So the importance of data interchange is that you allow, as we've touched on before, you allow a kind of ecosystem of interoperability so the data can survive. And I think we recognize that data is more important than code in that we think that having a version control system for data isn't actually more important than having a version control system for code, which is why we feel that the timeline, the bitemporality in our database is absolutely primary because... Always got to sneak in a reference to XT, (laughs) DB. But can I ask a question then? Let's go with this event sourcing world. So domain-driven design, the DDD, let's say users, they're more empowered now to maintain and to create these different event streams that are sort of appearing out of all the facts and events that get ingested. And you can imagine that this is more of a low-code future. 
because instead of all these different UIs that we're building for all the different data shapes, because the data is locked up, so we're presenting all these UIs and we're coding them all the time, this future might be more generic sort of UIs that can just help the users to visualize these events. But then isn't that putting all of the hope into users being able to work with data? But then what happens if there's so much data and then users think, oh, I just want a slightly different view. Wouldn't it have been great if we can go back in time and the events had this field and you can munge it from these two other fields and things. And then our users are now having to do these extraordinarily complicated jobs to migrate data, to correct data, to present different views of data. So I'm just kind of cynical, like, is data always free? But if there's so much data, presumably there's just a cost to asking users to work with that data. That's not like a panacea, right? You can't get the coders completely out of the way. I guess what I'm saying is there's going to have to be a balance, right? At some point, the coders have to come back in and say, okay, we can't just give you like a free-for-all access because there's just so much of it. It's complicated. There's security. There's lots of like things that we have to take care of. So therefore, we need to find out what that balance is. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. If the domain is complex and you just give users the power, then they become de facto programmers, but just not very qualified ones. If they're in a situation where a user's trying to come up with some sort of DSL to transform some data shape to something else, they are really a de facto program at that point. You haven't really improved anything. Mm. As developers, you've increased your count of developers. And I don't know what the answer really is, but it feels that would be the wrong answer. The right answer has to be to do it in such a way that you retain a huge degree of simplicity. There has to be these technologies like, you know, sometimes domain-specific languages are used. At least that's the start of trying to simplify having really good abstractions that prevent users from falling into these traps. Something we often talk about in XCDB is always housing this idea of having really well-refined core, just some fundamental operations. And often we might say as a team, hey, wouldn't it be great if we added this to the API to allow the user to do X? But then the pushback is always, well, if you just bloat up the API, that's more of the API to maintain, and we have to educate the users more, and that can be done in user space. So anything that can be done in user space, let's try and get it done there. And you can have like an onion, so layers of your product, but then the core just have to get the fundamentals right, and almost the less of the core, the better. I think there's a big point there, yeah, that this idea of a core is something that's more constrained than a Turing machine. There's a spectrum between user and programmer, or developer or engineer. I don't think we want to go to a world where there's two very discrete camps. And I think we're already largely in that world. And talking to Stephen earlier, we were discussing uh, the state of mobile application development and how uh, I hadn't realized this, and he hadn't until recently, that in order to compile and preview a, like a mobile app, a few years ago, even you'd fire up a preview in Android Studio on your machine of your Android application. But no one does that apparently these days. They all connect it directly to their phones. And obviously, I'm showing my ignorance of mobile application development. But yeah, the point is, you're not even using the device you're developing for. You have to get another device to connect. So as a user of a phone, you can't also be a developer of that phone without having a completely separate development device. And you know, the way Apple pitch their machines is, yeah, to these sort of expert class of people. But I still think it's a big spectrum. And the tipping point, if there was one, is does the user have to know the fundamentals of computer science in order to solve the problem at hand? Like, do they have to be aware of the limits of memory or recursion or you know, what a true machine is in order to solve the problem? Ideally, they should never have to know that. And we can hide everything users need to do behind DSLs, whether they're sort of declarative data query languages or something slightly more domain specific. If there was a boundary, that it would be something shaped like that. I think that is what users want. They want concise textual thing, more often than not, that describes what it is they want and they can manipulate that and they can learn the constrained rules of the system and know that it's not going to you know, cause a big system outage or break down as it scales. Yeah, I, I like the idea of this sort of graduation of expertise. I think we are pointing to a sort of unnatural dichotomy between developers who are on one side and users who are another. These walls that exist where you're not allowed for some reason to tamper with your phone or there are these kind of restrictions. But I think what a mature industry would look like is that you would have this quite smooth graduated slope. Firstly, where there would be a way of a user becoming a power user, becoming kind of a developer, becoming a power developer, if you like, if you just have this quite easy way of promoting up to levels of competence. But at the same time, there's enough safety in the system to prevent people from writing at levels that they shouldn't be writing at. For example, it shouldn't be possible for users to insert uh, server-side request forgery attacks or not do input sanitization. It shouldn't be possible for users to 
accidentally putting vulnerabilities into the system. I would say that would be a good mature industry that prevented that. But right now we're nowhere near it. Right? We still have all kinds of industrial accidents that call it that, right? where people are working beyond their skill level in many situations. I don't think the answer is just let's have a body of users and developers. That, to my mind, doesn't work. What do we look for? How do we create software that encourages this nice, smooth graduation of competency? And it seems like there are probably going to be a a number of different techniques because there's quite a spectrum of the different kinds of software that we're talking about. On one end of the spectrum, you have the Microsoft accesses and the visual basics of the world. And on the other end of the spectrum, you probably have banking software <laughs> where I I would be uncomfortable to know that a large number of non-technical employees at my bank had power user access to modifying the bank's software. I, I kind of like that the bank software doesn't change very frequently. And somewhere in the middle, you probably have all sorts of consumer software that may have reason for that outer onion layer to provide some programmatic access or some extra ability to empower the user to change the software itself. And it certainly seems as though we actually have a number of these tools that are almost there. We have some scripting languages. We have some ways to empower the user through the user interface or to give them their data in such a way that they can do whatever they want with it. But it's perhaps maybe just a mark of the times that I was saying to Jeremy earlier that you don't really hear rapid application development anymore the way you did in the late 1990s or early 2000s. And I do have a number of friends who lament that, not just in Juxt, but elsewhere, where they wish that we would revisit these problems and try to solve them with modern techniques, particularly the tools of the web, because a lot of those tools are built on client-side code with JavaScript and open data with HTML and XML and JSON. It feels like we have a lot of the tools at our disposal to build these kinds of very flexible systems. We just haven't bothered to do it yet. I completely agree. I think that's almost around the corner. There are some examples. I think the games industry is quite interesting because you can start off as just a gamer and then you configure your character or you buy some digital assets. And then you might get into a modding community where you modify the game, which is much more smelly than it should be because there's no free software around. And I know with the example of Minecraft, it's made much worse. So every, all the code is obfuscated and you know you have to reverse engineer it. But still, there's people willing to go through those hurdles. Once you get into modding games, you can get into things like Unity, where you can start creating your own games, watching other YouTubers and learning stuff like we used to do in the days of copying down basic code from magazines. It's sort of equivalent community of people watching other YouTubers and getting basic games going. And then, of course, people can join games companies and write games engines. Or even before they do that, there's level designers. So an awful number of different roles. There's a lot of roles from gamer to game full game developer. There are quite a lot of little ladders. So what I'm really trying to figure out is how we would create enterprise software or even custom software development, how we would give users a little bit more steps that they could become part of the development process rather than this huge cliff, I think, that we've created. I think that's what I'm sort of getting at. What are the little steps that we can create to help users be a little bit more self-serving than we have today? Dare I try to unveil what one of those new tools around the corner might be? So GraphQL is interesting in this space, isn't it? Because it gives users this query language where they can navigate the schema, they can understand what kind of queries that they can do, the queries are documented. Like once you figure out this alien syntax, like, you know, from a business user having never seen it before, once you get over that hurdle, it should be quite straightforward just to navigate and query your big graph of data that an organization might have. And then, of course, there's more to it. But I think that's interesting, isn't it? Because it's a marriage between the users and the devs that are powering that underlying schema. So the devs are writing the resolvers that actually resolve the different nodes of the graph. There they can apply security and things to make it fast, and intelligent caching, all that kind of thing. But is this like a good example of how it might go? Like rather than saying to a business user, hey, we're going to build you 10 UIs for all the different parts of these departments, you just say, hang on, no, here's like a single GraphQL endpoint. You know, here's a internal website where you can go. There's autocomplete. You can start to build up your graph query. Hopefully it's intuitive. If you've got any questions, ask us and just see how you do. 
they might come back and say, well, I need a bit more power. I'd like the query to do this. And then, you know, we start to advance what that query can do. But um, what do you think? I think that's a very good example because it's a very safe environment. Ideally, your GraphQL queries can't bring down the entire system. You know, that one would have thought there are some controls in the result on to make sure. I mean, a little bit like SQL, although if you wrote a really big query, you could kind of slow down the box for everybody else. I mean, to what extent is SQL safe in that if everybody had unfettered access to write whatever SQL they want, people just write really ridiculous joins that would cause the whole thing to come crunching down. But I think things like SQL, you know, SQL might be a slightly different step, but those things, I know SQL is old, but I think it's also a good example, like GraphQL, it's that type of thing, that type of abstraction. Those are the ingredients to a solution, I think. I'm just feeling that users these days, though, they tend to want the flashy UIs, you know, the iPad style interfaces where, hey, here's a big panel that shows some alerts. I can click on it and then it draws down to the next thing. As a consultancy, we're building solutions for our customers. And what you're suggesting is we have to re-educate or we have to say, actually, no, you don't want that really whizzy UI that a competitor has. What you want is a GraphQL console or what you really want is some reporting. Here's like a SQL endpoint and a console. Just go and hit that, write your queries against that. That would be the more moral thing to do, right? Because like we're just giving them more power, some education and some investment from their side. They're going to go a lot longer. They don't have to own this software that they always have to invest in to keep alive. You've reminded me of a system that we once had where it was just kind of reports for users, but every panel, there was a little button that you could press and it would flip the panel around. And on the other side of the panel was a whole load of Erlang that ran to produce the report. And if you wanted, you could edit the Erlang or copy and paste it to another report. And then you might not know Erlang, but you might learn Erlang the way that we learned, you know, basic back in the day, where if I copy green and I make that red, then I might get a different color. I'll try it. I don't think Erlang's probably the best DSL, but that idea that you can say, oh, there's a little rabbit hole down here. If I click on that, I go a little bit deeper and I play around in another safe environment because I think that Erlang was chosen because it was quite a safe environment, you know, and you keep going down and down and down and you allow a user at each point to decide at what place they feel they feel safe and or do they want to venture further down until eventually there's some sort of machine code sticking out. But that's the sort of power, maybe it's through languages and maybe it's through things that are a bit like languages, but user level languages. But I think that was a key. Lotus Notes had that. Excel has that in VBA. So there is a kind of a language underneath. Lotus had this weird one, but it was still a language. We have to give a hat to Emacs. We can't sort of skirt around it forever. You know, the eLisp that allows the user to do weird and wonderful things and copy their sort of eLisp to make new programs. But then if you want to use Emacs and you don't have to know eLisp at all, you never have to encounter it. You can sort of plug in themes and, and just become like a power user of all the buffers and windows. And I'm sure if you go, you know, all the way, I haven't personally, but you can go down to that C core and make use of that at some point. So lots of rabbit holes. I think that's the best example of, of the afternoon because I think all of us are Emacs users and I think we all probably have gravitated to that style of application because we feel that we've got a nice trade of power and convenience. When we need to, if something doesn't work, we don't have to call up the developers or file. I've never filed a bug on Emacs, you know, bug list. I don't even know where how, how you would go about doing it. Because you can just make do with what you know. You don't have to be a total expert to do it either. And I think that it's those kinds of, yeah, maybe it's like Emacs for the enterprise. What's the equivalent of Emacs in a large company, a distributed sort of Emacs-like business system? Are we talking about like a layered architecture? Cause that's kind of what we're discussing here, isn't it? GraphQL and SQL, they're like layers on top of an underlying core. And the core never stops, does it? You can keep on going down all the way. Yeah, layers, but more than just layers. You can have a lot of architectures that are layers, layers that somehow invite the people at the outer layers in. You know, that there are some documentation maybe or something that allows people in a safe way. And I think there's keep on going on about the importance of safety because if you allow people to feel safe, and that often that means that they are allowed to mess up and make mistakes, just something like an undo button is really key. Jeremy was showing me the power of the undo in Inkscape. We were trying to create a logo, got to a complete mess. And Jeremy just suggested I hit the undo key 3,000 times. <laughs> and it absolutely worked and got out of the mess. And then we copied and pasted something. And then we did redo 3,000 times to get back. But we had the old copy. And, and that just allowed me to feel confident with Inkscape. Safety is massively underrated in the whole kind of IT landscape. You've got to 
create that feeling of security, then people will venture into things. They'll get out of their comfort zone much more easily. Okay, everyone. So we've discussed trying to empower users to create software where the users can do more. And we're not always pushing everything deep down to the core of the application. So the whole of the application needs to be continuously changed and deployed, which is a very expensive process. Final thoughts on what we should think about and how we should do this. I think we should be much more ambitious in the kinds of systems that we could visualize in 10 or 20 years. I think there's been a bit of a fatalism in, in the programming industry that shows a sort of lack of confidence that we've kind of finished. There's no, going to be no more radical things, changes. And yet there just seems to be, you know, new things all the time. So I think we should just be a bit more confident about what we can achieve. I think we should hark on less about Conway's law and the, the limits of what we how we can organize our IT and that sort of thing. I think we should be quite bold and try to make uh, strides into a future. Even though we think these problems are really, really hard, we should carry on trying to tackle them. Because I think in 5, 10, 15 years, the, the um, opportunities for improving the lives of users might be much better. Stephen, you got any uh, sign-off words? I think my closing thoughts would be, I like this idea of combining the technologies we're most enamored with here, being web technologies on one side and Emacs on the other. I would like a web browser that's essentially Emacs under the covers. I can dig into it as, as deep as I want and get myself into a constrained amount of trouble. That sounds fun. You should go and speak to Hawkan, like our fellow team member, because he tried to do that. So first of all, he tried to rewrite Emacs in Java and JVM, so away from that C core. And then he thought, hang on, this really looks to be a web technology. So he tried to build it using JavaScript. We have that mission already underway, if you want to help out. Jeremy? Yeah, I think Malcolm's point about safety probably is the most significant. And the undo is probably the biggest example of safety within users. And in my notes for this, I didn't mention it, but I feel like the clipboard is a big feature in the operating system, which enables users to be empowered at the most minimal level. But the biggest problem with the clipboard, at least the default implementation, is there's no history. And so there's no undo button for when I accidentally copy instead of paste the thing, and I have to go back to the thing to copy it again. It's ridiculous. If we could solve the global undo problem, not just on one machine, but across all machines, using some kind of versioned data store, I really think the world would be in a, would be in a better state. I think disks are so cheap, everything should be immutable. And if we can make things efficient, most things will get simpler. So that should be at the forefront of everyone's minds, I think. And uh, if we're building network services where things are flying around without proper versions or timestamps, you know, we're just creating problems for ourselves in the future. So I hope we can move back to a world where things are simpler and that's made possible via having big hard disks. Great. The product manager for XCDB speaks. That's great. Thanks, everyone. I guess my thought would be instead of responding to change over following a plan, always probably to have more of a plan, actually, to build a little bit more of a skyscraper as opposed to something that's always changing. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to Season 3, Episode 2, User Empowerment of the Juxcast.